welcome to the White Harvest, a podcast designed to equip the local church in areas of apologetics, evangelism, and discipleship. I'm Charlie Parrish. And I'm Garrett Scarbina. Thank you for joining us today for episode 13 of the White Harvest. And today we're going to discuss a philosophical ideology that is quickly becoming America's new institutional orthodoxy, some would even say religion, and that is critical race theory. Now, critical race theory, CRT for short, is a derivative of Marxism, and it classifies people by skin color over their character. And that's just kind of a a brief definition of what it is. Uh, Critical race theory has not only been saturated by our culture, but it's also bleeding into the church of Christ as we speak. And many Christians have little to, to zero knowledge of what critical race theory is and the implications behind it. And the reason they don't have knowledge is because they don't seek to know what it is. Now, we know that any knowledge worth having requires work. It doesn't come easy. And critical race theory is banking on people staying ignorant, especially when it comes to the church. In fact, Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. So this is a crucial topic that we have got to be informed about, especially in the church, as it pertains to the the body of Christ at large, but also Baptist right now. As you know, Garrett, the Southern Baptist Convention, this ideology is seeping in at a rapid rate. Uh, I was in Birmingham in 2019 at the Southern Baptist Convention when Resolution 9 was passed. Mm -hmm. Now, we'll talk more about this in future episodes, uh, but basically Resolution 9 said this, that critical race theory and intersectionality were adopted as analytical tools. Now, they said that, no, we don't believe in the ideologies, but they said, we're just going to use this within the convention as an analytical tool. Basically, they're saying that secular ideologies are what we need to evangelize. Mm -hmm. Uh, Curtis Woods, who is the chairman of the Southern Baptist Convention Personnel Committee, in 2019 in Birmingham said this, It is our aspiration in this resolution simply to say that critical race theory and intersectionality are simply analytical tools. They are to be used as tools and not a worldview. Now, the problem with that statement is that critical race theory and intersectionality are absolutely a worldview. It's it's a secular worldview that's another gospel. And basically to say that we need to use these ideologies in our evangelism is to say that Scripture is not enough, that we need to incorporate the ways and the, the worldviews of the secular world in our evangelism. But we don't need secular worldviews to help us reach the lost. The gospel does that. So critical race theory is, uh, and this is just another rabbit trail. Uh, Garrett and I were talking before the beginning of this podcast. This ideology has so many far-reaching tentacles that it's really hard to know where to begin when we discuss these things. Uh, Critical race theory is a a derivative of the postmodern mindset. Uh, Again, very briefly, postmodernism basically means that truth is relative. There is no truth. Uh, Truth is determined by your quote-unquote lived experience. Uh, And so, therefore, what is true for you may not be true for others. Now, if you carry the postmodern mindset, which is truth is relative, to its logical conclusion— then truth does not exist, which, ironically, that is a truth statement (laughs) to say truth doesn't exist. There are so many off-roads to critical race theory that it's hard to know where to begin this conversation. But again, this is something that the church must seek and must know about, this knowledge of this worldview that is seeping in very rapidly. At its root, critical race theory is racism. It's an ideology of division and hatred. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9, uh, it's written this, What has been done, it is what will be done. And what has been done is what will be done. So there is nothing new under the sun. Now that's King Solomon. And in the same way, we can look at our own culture. There's nothing new under the sun. Uh, Critical race theory is not some brand new worldview or brand new ideology that has just now come on the scene. It's been around for decades. Man justifying racial division has always been. Amen, Charlie. Yes. If someone had invented critical theory in the first century, they could have certainly found plenty of uh, groups of people, divisions of people that they could have pitted against one another. And in fact, that's how we're going to start this episode today. Uh, Before we start diving into the details of 
Um, what is critical theory? Who were the, the fathers of this uh, ideology? How did they come to form these ideas and so on and so forth? First, we want to prepare ourselves by looking at uh, what does the gospel of Jesus Christ do with these groups of people? Um, one of the unique beauties of the gospel is that it unifies people who would otherwise have nothing to do with one another. Mm -hmm. And so what we're going to do today is look briefly at some of the divisions that existed in the first century and how the Apostle Paul tells us that those things don't matter. Mm -hmm. If Jesus Christ is your Lord, your Savior, your King, your God, then anything else, any other category that you might use to uh, divide people, doesn't matter. Throw it away. And so we're going to be looking today at a passage in the book of Colossians, interestingly enough, since we're walking through Colossians on Sunday mornings right now. But if you've got your Bibles with you, open with us to chapter 3, verse 11, which reads like this. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and not, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is all and in all. So here Paul is using several groups, several categories of people that, um, for one reason or another, had something against one another in the original world. And, and I'm going to spend my time here today just walking through some of those groups, illustrating from their own words, from their own context, what kind of beef these people had with each other, essentially. First, we're going to take a look at that category of Greek and Jew, circumcised and not. This first excerpt that I want to read for us comes from the book, As the Romans Did, a source book in Roman social history by Joanne Shelton. And this is a book that's filled with uh, primary source quotations from the ancient Greco-Roman world, illustrating so many facets of what daily life looked like in the first century. It's, it's a wonderful book for anyone to pick up if they want to be able to just visualize in their minds what uh, all of these events going on in the New Testament, what it might have looked like. But first I want to read a brief excerpt from pages 405 and 406, and this illustrates the hostility that the Romans had toward the Jewish people. Shelton says this, The Romans were quite tolerant of other religions, but since they equated the health of the state with scrupulous worship of the state gods, the wish of the Jews to remain a separate community, and their refusal to worship any god but their own, frequently made them targets of suspicion and hatred. So catch that. The Romans knew that the Jews were the only people who wouldn't worship the Roman gods, and the Romans resented them for that because it meant that the Roman gods might not bless the empire with as much material wealth and military success and so on and so forth. Shelton continues, We have earlier seen examples of the prejudice of individuals, but sometimes the entire state instituted a policy of persecution against the Jews. And then uh, Shelton quotes Suetonius, an important uh, Roman historian. And he says, the emperor Tiberius suppressed foreign cults, such as the Egyptian and Jewish religions, by forcing those who embraced such superstitions to burn their religious vestments and their holy objects. Using required military service as a pretext, he assigned young Jews to provinces with harsher climates. Other men of that same race, or belonging to similar cults, he banished from the city under penalty of lifelong slavery if they did not obey. He also expelled astrologers, although he granted pardon to those who begged for it and promised to give up their practice. So there you see that there is no love lost for the Jew in the mind of the Greek. But we likewise see a certain amount of animosity from the Jewish side right back at the uncircumcised. I'm now quoting a little bit from the Babylonian Talmud, which, uh, uh, for those who don't know, the Talmud is a an enormous corpus of books, absolutely enormous, that was compiled in about the year 600 AD, which in essence, if you were to open it up and start reading it, it is a collection of extra-biblical Jewish laws, what some call the Oral Torah. It was the, the, the additional commandments against which uh, Jesus spoke so frequently in the New Testament. But you have this uh, 
very long list of additional rules regarding everyday aspects of life, and then you have additional rabbinic commentary on top of it. That's the Talmud. Um, it's extremely valuable for understanding the thought processes and the theologies of the Jewish people, uh, not only during the time of Jesus, but also shortly before and shortly after. And I had looked for a couple of quotes. I actually couldn't find one of them. But I remember learning once that there is somewhere in the Talmud where um, it is stated that if a Jewish man is touched by the shadow of a Gentile, he should run for the nearest mikveh, the nearest ritual bath, and seek to cleanse himself mm. because the Gentile's shadow had caused ritual impurity upon him. And I was, I was looking for that quote earlier this week. I, I apologize, I couldn't find it in time. But here's another one I can quote for you exactly uh, from Tractate Brachot, Chapter 8, Folio 51b. One may neither recite a blessing over the candle nor over the spices of Gentiles. So here, within the context... Um, the rabbis are saying that when Jewish people are sitting at meals and they're offering thanks to God, they're lighting candles and incense and so forth, uh, they cannot use spices and incense and candles that have come from a Gentile marketplace. Because again, that, that's ritual impurity there. And then later in the same chapter, they say, if one is walking in the marketplace of the Gentiles and is pleased to smell the spices available for sale, he is a sinner. Now, uh, of course, we want to be careful. We, we want to use careful methods of interpretation with the Talmud the same way we would with the Bible. There are some who have a rather strong antipathy toward the Talmud, a, a kind of anti-Semitic bent, and I want to state plainly and up front that I, I don't advocate for that at all. But um, what we should take away from these couple of readings is not necessarily that the Jewish rabbis hated Gentiles. I'm sure certain individuals did, but it was more an attitude of the Jewish people recognized that they were to be separate from the Gentiles, and these rabbinic authorities uh, were strong and zealous in their pursuit of that. Now, of course, that somewhat neglects the Old Testament passages that talk about being a light to the nations, so on and so forth. Uh, this is actually similar to a discussion I had on Sunday morning during the sermon about the Pharisees mistook the covenant for the covenant sign. But all of this is to say that there was certainly no love lost between Greeks and Jews, circumcised and not. Next in the list, in Colossians 3.11, you have barbarians. Now, barbarian was a generic umbrella term that was basically used for anyone who wasn't Hellenized, who didn't speak the Greek language, didn't know the basics of uh, Greek culture. These were the people up north in Europe around Germany and the British Isles and going over into Scandinavia and um, over into uh, Asia, so on and so forth. Those who spoke the Greek language and knew the basics of Greek history looked at these barbarians as being less civilized than them, uh, less human. They bordered on animals in the eyes of Hellenists. Next, we have Scythians, and these were an especially hated people group. Um, they uh, they originated from the nebulous region where uh, Europe meets Asia, up in the Caucasus Mountains, the nation of Georgia, southwestern um, Russia, that whole region. And they were universally hated by everyone who knew them. Uh, I have a couple of passages here from intertestamental writings, 3 Maccabees 7.5. They also led them out with harsh treatment as slaves, or rather as traitors, and girding themselves with a cruelty more savage than that of Scythian custom, they tried without any inquiry or examination to put them to death. 4th Maccabees 10.7 Since they were not able in any way to break his spirit, they abandoned the instruments and scalped him with their fingernails in a Scythian fashion. There's an important Greek historian named Herodotus, who in his Book of Histories, Book 4, Chapter 1, says that the Scythians blinded all of their slaves to prevent them from stealing milk. The Assyrian king Esarchadon describes going to war with the Scythian king Bartatua. And then I'm quoting from an article by a renowned evangelical scholar named Edwin Yamauchi. He says this concerning the Scythians. There is no doubt that the practice that gave the Scythians their lasting reputation for savagery was their brutal treatment of their enemies. In the battlefield, the Scythians would drink the blood of the first enemy they killed. Their practice of bringing the severed head of an enemy to their chief is depicted on an ornamental cup. The Scythians would also scalp their victims and then use the scalp as a napkin. 
At times, they would flay the entire skin and use it or display it. The Greeks actually invented the word aposkithesin, literally meaning from the Scythians, so to be Scythianized, for the process of scalping. The Scythians would also take the top of a skull, decorate it, and use it as a drinking bowl. That these are not simply wild tales has been proven by archaeological evidence. From the frozen tombs at Pazirik, a warrior whose skin was tattooed had been scalped. From a recent excavation at a 7th through 6th century BC settlement at Belsk in the Ukraine, the excavations have uncovered a skull cap workshop with several human skull tops, which had already been made into drinking bowls with handles made from temple bones. The point here, being quite obvious, I hope, is that nobody liked the Scythians. <laughs> And yet here in Colossians 3, verse 11, Paul lists the presumed Scythian members of the Colossian church as being among those for whom Christ died. Finally, in our Colossians 3, 11 list, we have slaves mentioned. Now in the Greco-Roman world, slavery was an everyday reality. It was a key part of the economy. Um, various demographic uh, indicators have shown that as much as 30% of the population of the Roman Empire was consisted of slaves. Now, some were treated fairly well, depending on the disposition of their master and where they were employed. There were household slaves, there were farm slaves, there were slaves who were sent to the mines. And so it, there was some room for variation, but uh, there were certainly plenty of slaves who were treated exceedingly cruelly. And here I'm going to return to Hackett's book, As the Romans Did, and I'm going to read for us briefly from pages 173 to 174 regarding cruelty to slaves. Hackett says this, In Roman law, slaves were considered to be property, not persons. Legally, they had no families and no state. Their only legal relationship was the one with their owner. An individual who had been enslaved rather than born into slavery, was stripped of his former identity and associations and was even given a new name. Slaves had no rights and no moral standing. We have earlier noted the correlation between high social standing and exemption from corporal punishment. At the other end of the scale, slaves were continually subjected to physical abuse. Flogging was a common occurrence, but we also hear of branding and of mutilation such as leg breaking and eye gouging. Sexual assault was another frequent form of abuse. In some cases, these violations of the integrity of the slave's body were intended as punishments for real or perceived misconduct. And for capital offenses, slaves received the most brutal of penalties, such as crucifixion and burning alive. However, the harshness of these measures seems to our sensibilities out of proportion to the nature of the offense. And often, slaves suffered hideous treatment not because of their own faults, but because of the cruel disposition of their owner. Moreover, the threat of physical violence was used as a powerful tool to enforce submission among one's slaves, particularly in households where slaves greatly outnumbered owners. A more subtle, but no less frightening threat, was the possibility of having one's children or spouse sold to another owner. In our reflections on slave-owning societies, we should consider the horror not only of physical abuse, but also of psychological oppression caused by fear, vulnerability, and powerlessness. When the struggling porter, and here she quotes from another source earlier in the book, a man who was subjected to slave-like amounts of labor even though he was a free man, and he asserts in his defense that he is indeed free, and he is, in effect, reminding his employers that he has never suffered the physical and psychological degradation that slaves suffer and cannot now be made subject to such degradation. Although slaves and free workers might do the same jobs, the free worker's status as a person, rather than as property, was of enormous importance. So there you have the beauty of the gospel illustrated by contrast when Paul in his household codes of Colossians 3 through 4 and Ephesians 4 through 6, he tells slaves and masters that they are brothers in the family of Christ and that they are to treat each other as such. For one last example, let's take a quick look at a parallel passage in Galatians 3 verse 28. 
Now, Paul is addressing different sets of enemies in Galatians and Colossians, but actually he ends up making a similar point in both of his counter-arguments about the unity that Christ's sacrifice brings to his body. Let's read together Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And we want to hone in on that feature that's unique to Galatians, male and female. And I want to illustrate the power of this statement this way. Women in Roman society were valued as, well, that's just it. They, they were not as valued as men were. They were not able to uh, contribute uh, to society as much. They weren't able to get jobs. They weren't able to sustain themselves. They were viewed as being lesser than men. And as a result, baby girls, when they were born, were subjected to what was called exposure. The idea was that the parents, when they didn't want the child for one reason or another, they would take them out to the local city garbage dump and would leave them there to starve to death. And no one within Greco-Roman society uh, wanted to take on that additional burden, except for Christians. And I, I'm going to get back to that in just a moment, but let me read to you one last time from Shelton's book on page 28 regarding exposure. If the birth of an unwanted child was not prevented by contraception or abortion, the parents still had one further method available to them to limit the size of their family. They could expose the newborn infant, that is, leave it to be picked up by a stranger, or more likely, to die from starvation and other natural causes. Exposure was perhaps more common than infanticide, which is the immediate and active killing of an infant, by suffocation, for example. Infants were exposed for various reasons. Sick or deformed infants were usually exposed, and infant girls were exposed more often because girls were a financial burden. They could not work to support themselves, and they needed dowries. And then I'm going to read to you from a couple of tragic examples. We have this letter from what's called the collection of the Oxyrhynchus papyri. This is a, a garbage dump in ancient Egypt where there were actually thousands upon thousands of ancient Greek letters that really helped to illustrate the ancient world. Here's one letter that is, quite frankly, a tragedy to read. It says, I send you my warmest greetings. I want you to know that we are still in Alexandria, and please don't worry if all the others come home but I remain. I beg you and entreat you to take care of the child, and if I receive my pay soon, I will send it to you. If you have the baby before I return, if it is a boy, let it live, but if it is a girl, expose it. And then another important writer from the ancient world, a man by the name of Ovid, he tells a story in his, his book Metamorphoses. He says, Ligdus was a freeborn man, but from a lower class family. He was a poor man, but moral and honorable. He told his pregnant wife when she was approaching labor, I pray for two things, that you may have an easy labor and that you may have a male child. For a daughter is too burdensome, and we just don't have the money. I hate to say this, but if you should bear a girl, I say this with great reluctance, if you should bear a girl, we'll have to kill her. Such was the common view in the ancient world, that women were not only ontologically lesser than men, that is, they were of their very nature lesser than men, but that they were also more of a burden, so it was justified to kill baby girls as a result. How radical is it then when the Apostle Paul tells us in Galatians 3 that it doesn't matter whether you are male or female. He goes back not to Greco-Roman conceptions of what man and woman are. He goes back to the Old Testament. He goes back to Genesis, where God creates man and woman equally. They are, they are different. They function differently. They have different roles, but they are ontologically equal. They are valued equally the same. And he brings that forward into the New Covenant era and says, it doesn't matter whether you are born man or woman. If you are covered by the blood of the Lamb, you are a valued member of God's covenant family. How radical and how beautiful is that? And then I would encourage our readers, one last thing, to read Romans 16 and Revelation 5. Now, Romans 16, you might initially be confused. It's just a long list of names. It's, it's Paul at the end of his grand work of Romans saying, greet so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. He goes on for something like 20 or 25 verses, I think, uh, just listing a bunch of names. It's the kind of passage that we normally just avoid. It, it doesn't seem to teach us anything. But what's fascinating is that you look into it, you understand 
uh, the scriptures in their original worldview context, Paul is putting a pin into the end of his message that illustrates exactly what he's been talking about. Romans chapters 1 through 11 illustrate that um, all people, whether Jew or Gentile, are justified the same way by faith in Jesus Christ and not by works. And then Romans 12 through 15 is the practical application of that. In light of that, how are redeemed people supposed to live? And then right there at the end in Romans 16, he gives this long list of names and says, greet all of them for me. And what's fascinating is you look into the etymology, the, the origins of those names, and he's got a mixed multitude in there. There are Jewish names, there are Greek names, there are Roman names. And he is illustrating the very point that he's been making the whole time, that God's family, and this takes us to Revelation chapter 5, Jesus is building for himself a particular people out of every tribe, every nation, every language. And God receives a unique glory in that, that in the age to come, in the future new heavens and new earth, he will have a people that is built from every walk of life, every skin color, every language, every disposition. It does not matter. That is the beauty of the gospel, is that he is sufficient to overstep and overcome all of those boundaries. So having said all of that, Brother Charlie, now that we've covered, I think fairly adequately, biblical foundations for unity, talk to us by contrast about the history, the epistemology, and the effects of critical theory both upon the evangelical sphere and upon broader society in the present day. Yeah, Garrett, that was great. Context matters. That's something we say a lot from the pulpit. And history matters. And you did a great job pointing out that every ethnicity has a history of sin. And the problem with critical race theory is they hold hostage or, or keep in bondage those that have committed sin. As a people group, there is no forgiveness. There is no repentance. Uh, there is no Christian worldview there. There's no forgiveness in Christ. So we're seeing that, and that's so key. Uh, you know, again, as Hosea said, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. We, in, in the same way, are destroyed in our thinking and understanding when we have no idea the roots of these worldviews and where they're coming from. Uh, so that was very, very helpful. Uh, just to bring it up modern day and to show you how this has transferred into philosophy, uh, critical race theory is a derivative of critical theory. Now, its beginnings can be traced back to Marxism. Don't have a lot of time to go into fully uh, what Marxism was, but Karl Marx was a 19th century philosopher who wrote the Communist Manifesto. Uh, Marx desired economic equality of outcome. Now, he saw people as the oppressed and the oppressors. Those were the two classes, or rather the two lenses that he viewed the world, through those that were oppressors and those that were oppressed. And he sought to tear down this economic power system that he saw. Basically, the oppressors were the, the rich, and those that were being oppressed were the poor. So what Marx desired was an equal distribution of wealth, uh, and, and that's how he saw the world. If you were rich, you were, by nature, regardless of, of your character, you were an, an oppressor. And if you were poor, well, then you were oppressed. Now, 20th century, Antonio Gramsci comes along. He's a philosopher. And Gramsci carried the work of Marx a little bit further. Gramsci looked at the poor, and he looked in the in the in terms of oppressed and oppressor the same way. He saw the rich as the oppressors and the poor as the oppressed. But Gramsci began to ask the question, why aren't the poor rising up? Why are the oppressed not rising up and doing something about it? Why are they just working their regular jobs? Why don't they see this? And Gramsci drew the correlation that the reason they weren't rising up was because the poor, the oppressed, needed to be quote unquote woken to their reality. So there therefore that that opens us up to the term woke, which we'll discuss further uh, in episodes and in a little bit. But basically Marxism proposes that the socioeconomic classes are categorized by the oppressed, which are the poor, and the oppressors, which are the rich. And the Marxist solution to this, and Gramsci's solution to this, neo-Marxism is what Gramsci was known for, is an uprising of the oppressed and have a state redistribution of wealth. That's what they were seeking, this massive uprising. 
Now, the problem with Marxism is it goes against not only human nature, but God's design. Humans were created to create and also earn, not only for the state, but for their family as well. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, Paul writes this, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Now, here's the fallacy, or, or rather one of them. Marxism would see the state stealing from the laborers, okay? Contrary to what Paul wrote in Ephesians 4. Instead of allowing the laborers the joy of sharing their profits with others. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart. Now, listen to this. It's talking about the concept of giving. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. In Acts chapter 2, we get this picture. The people were not giving to one another out of compulsion, but rather it was voluntary. They were giving out of love, not state-mandated as Marxism would have it. So critical theory, this brings us to the term critical theory. This was coined in 1930 by a man named Max Heukenheimer at the Frankfurt School in Germany. Now, real quick, a summary of critical theory. Basically, they view culture, people, in categories, like Marx did, in oppressed and oppressors. So critical theory, Max Heukenheimer basically just took Marxism, he, he took Gramsci and Marxism, and, and gave it a nice little name, uh, critical theory theory. That's what it is. It's it's Marxism repackaged is what it is. So critical theory, again, and, it, and it's important we take this slow because it takes time to understand these things. Critical theory is basically the idea of oppressed and oppressors. That's how, that's how critical theory sees people and the culture. Now, apply critical theory to race and gender. You get critical race Theory. So you can understand where critical race theory is coming from. Marx's idea of critical race was the oppressed and the oppressors via the working class. But critical race theory sees the oppressed and the oppressors via race, via skin color. So critical race theory does not view people as individuals. Uh, for example, you may be a white male uh, who who loves all races, who loves all eth ethnicities. By the way, there's only one race, the human race. There's many ethnicities. The Bible does not recognize races. So there's many ethnicities, but only one race. Uh, but you may be a white male who, who loves everyone, regardless of skin color. Uh, you may be kind to all people. But according to critical race theory, as a white male, because you identify with the hegemonic powers, which we'll talk about in a minute, the dominant ideological group, that is, you're considered a racist. Just because of the group that you are associated with biologically, it doesn't matter who you are. It's just because of your skin color that you are considered a racist. Uh, the hegemonic power of society is seen as the oppressors. That's what the hegemony is, the perceived oppressors of society. So when you hear a big word like hegemony, and the reason I use this word is not to confuse everyone, but this is what you will hear and what you will read when you begin to look at this ideology. They seek to tear down the hegemonic powers. And again, the hegemonic powers, the hegemony, is the perceived ruling class. All forms of critical theory seek to tear down their perceived notion of the hegemonic powers. Now, Dr. Neil Shinvey wrote this, Hegemonic power is the ability to impose your group's values, expectations, and norms on the rest of society. According to critical theory, the culture's perceived dominant ideological groups, such as white, male, heterosexual, Christians, must be stripped of their power. Sociologist Nikki Cole wrote this, Cultural hegemony refers to the domination or rule maintained through ideological or cultural means. It is usually achieved through social institutions, which allow those in power to strongly influence the values, norms, ideas, expectations, worldview, and behavior of the rest of society. So the cultural hegemony in our society right now would be white, male, heterosexual, native-born Christians. That's what the ideological hegemony is or perceived powers in society. 
and critical theory believes that everyone who does not fall into these categories is a victim, is oppressed by the hegemony. So again, critical race theory seeks to tear down their perceived notions of of those who hold power, the hegemony uh, in society. Critical race theory redefines words to gain power. And this is genius on their part, but it's also a detriment. It's also dangerous if we don't understand what's happening. And so many believers are falling prey to the ideologies of critical race theory because they don't understand, number one, as you pointed out, the background, the history of where this is coming from, and number two, the wordplay that's happening. Uh, I'll use Black Lives Matter, the organization, for example. Now, I want to start off by saying I completely agree that black lives matter. Regardless of skin color, all men are created equal. Racism is a sin from the pit of hell. We are all created equal. One race, the human race, uh, in every way, we are equal in value and dignity. There is not one over the other. So I completely agree that black lives matter. Uh, Galatians 3.28 There is neither, and you read this, Garrett, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, you are all one in Christ Jesus. So again, there there are different ethnicities, but only one race. We are all, regardless of our skin color, brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, for those of us that know Jesus. Uh, And we seek for everyone to know. So we evangelize to all ethnicities, because we are one race. But the organization Black Lives Matter is not concerned about combating racism, and they're not concerned about the lives of of black lives. And you can see this in their stance on abortion. Uh, hundreds of thousands of of little image bearers of Christ uh, that are that are black being killed every year, and they don't speak up for them. Mm-hmm. Black Lives Matter claims, and they make this claim, to be a Marxist organization. Uh, Cultural Marxism, again, seeks to tear down, remember, the hegemony. And this was on their website, their mission statement. Now, they removed this because I think they began to see that it was kind of peeking behind the curtain and and letting people know the evil that lies in their worldview. But this was the Black Lives Matter manifesto, now removed. But this is what it said. We disrupt the Western-prescribed nuclear family structure requirement by supporting each other as extended families and villages that collectively care for one another, especially our children, to the degree that mothers, parents, and children are comfortable. So they want to disrupt the nuclear family. The nuclear family is one man, one woman. Uh, It is a husband, wife, father, mother, and a household. They they seek to tear this down. The nuclear family in Black Lives Matter, according to their manifesto, this is part of the hegemonic powers. This is part of the the dominating class, if you will, that has to be stripped of their powers. So again, you see, it's not just about race. It's also about the Christian worldview. The nuclear family, they say, we have got to tear this down. A home with a father and a mother, male, female, this is the design of God for the family. And the Black Lives Matter mission statement seeks to chip away at this foundation and change your worldview. So So do you see the wordplay we're dealing with here and the deception? You know, if you don't support Black Lives Matter, the organization, then you're called a racist. And if you do support the Black Lives Matter organization, then you must abandon the Christian worldview altogether. You have a choice to make, and they've got you where they want you. Because no matter what, according to their own little game, they win. Either you're a racist or you're going to conform to what they say. Uh, Vody Bauckham, who is who's a black pastor himself, wrote this: "Black Lives Matter is a phrase designed to use black people. And so, if I'm really concerned about issues in the black community, and I am, then I have to refuse and I have to repudiate that organization because they stand against that for which I am advocating. I can't support the Black Lives Matter organization because I love black people." And I would say yes and amen to that. So the language of critical race theory is deceptive. Critical race theory, or rather critical theory, categorizes people by the oppressed and the oppressors. That's how they see the world, not by your worth, not by your beliefs, but by your skin color, or rather by what class you are in. Critical theory seeks to tear down hegemonic powers or their perceived notion of powers in society, and critical theory identifies the oppressed 
via a term called intersectionality. Now, briefly, intersectionality, Kimberly Crenshaw was a civil rights advocate. She coined this word in 1989, and this is a basic definition of intersectionality. It states that the more marginalized cultural intersections that you cross, the more oppressed that you are, and therefore, the more society owes you. So I'll give you an example. Uh, if you are black, if you are female, if you are transgender, then you are greatly oppressed according to intersectionality and therefore given a larger voice or, or do a larger voice. Because black, female, transgender, according to the, the hegemonic pie chart that is critical race theory, these are all marginalized groups. So therefore, if you are in a marginalized group, according to intersectionality, the more intersections or rather check marks you can cross, the more society owes you. Mm. Now, going back to the Southern Baptist Convention, they voted to adopt the language of intersectionality as an analytical tool, also critical race theory. Intersectionality is the new caste system in our world today. Uh, there was an author named Balint Vassoni, and he came to the United States to escape the Nazi regime in Hungary and he wrote a book called America's 30-Year War. Now, in his book, he basically told how he ran away from, from what was happening in Europe by force only to come to the United States and see it happen over the course of a generation. Yeah. That's frightening to look at. Again, that's history playing out before us, or rather, history repeating itself. Mm -hmm. And we are so lulled to sleep or so apathetic in our understanding, because we don't take the time to know these things. Uh, and as Tom Askell said in, in his documentary on this, By What Standard, uh, looking at, at this worldview that is beginning to creep into the church, uh, his exact quote was, when someone asked what happened, uh, Askell said, we've been played. And, and his point was, we've been asleep at the wheel, and it's hit us before we even knew what was coming. So this is very confusing. All of this, again, many tentacles to this idea of critical theory, critical race theory, and it's because it's linked, it's tethered to the postmodern mindset. And again, I opened up by pointing this out. Postmodernism says that there is no objective truth. Truth is anything that you want it to be. Uh, truth is your perceived lived experience. That's what truth is. That's only what I feel. Here's an example of, of critical theory or critical race theory even seeping into the academic system. 2019, Seattle school system proposed to begin teaching students that mathematics, now listen to this, mathematics such as 2 plus 2 equals 4 is actually racist. Lee Onahan, who's in the system, wrote this, students will be taught how Western math is used as a tool of power and oppression. So you hear the words and that it di disenfranchises people and colors of community. They will be taught that Western math limits economic opportunities for people of color. Now, the result of this madness is that people cannot any longer engage in thoughtful discussions. Because if you answer wrongly, if, you're, if your answer to the question does not line up with the cultural Marxist, then you're considered a bigot and you're wrong and you're, as we know, as you're canceled now is the word, mm -hmm. by society. So critical theory, critical race theory is dangerous to not only our world, but to the church. And, and Christians desperately need to wake up. If we don't understand this ideology, then begin to do some research. Again, if you have YouTube, by what standard? Google that or YouTube that. Look up the, the documentary, By What Standard, uh, by Founders Ministries and Tom Askell. Phenomenal, but it goes through what happened at the Southern Baptist Convention in 2019, as well as the worldview of critical race theory and, and examines this and what's happening to the church. Now, we'll get into this more next week because there's so much to this. Uh, as you and I were talking about before the podcast, it's impossible to cram everything in uh, to one session. Uh, but critical theory, critical race theory, some churches are being defined as woke. Now, remember the term woke we talked about earlier? That's, that's a Gramsian term. Gramsian, Antonio Gramsci, uh, again, recapping, looked at the oppressed and the oppressors and asked the question, why aren't the oppressed people, why aren't they rising up against the oppressors? 
because they need to be woke, Gramsci said. They need to be awakened to their lived experience and realize this. So for those that do not buy into critical race theory, those that do buy into it would say that you're not woke yet. You haven't realized yet. This refers to being awakened to your oppression or awakened to the fact that you are an oppressor, as they would say, the popular critical theorist. James Lindsay wrote this, and this is very telling. If I were going to design a plan to bring down all of Christianity, I would make the church woke because then the church would eat itself from the inside. And that's exactly what's happening. That, that's a very telling statement by James Lindsay. If, if someone wanted to destroy Christianity, then all they would have to do is introduce woke ideology because it's a different gospel begin to have the church incorporate that into their evangelism. And as Lindsay said, then the church would eat itself from the inside. So this is why Resolution 9 at the Southern Baptist Convention is so very concerning. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, Paul wrote, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Now, critical theory is the exact opposite of what the Apostle Paul wrote in that verse. Critical theory, critical race theory, is an example of a deceitful human philosophy that is rooted in the elemental spirits of the world, and it's not according to Christ. The fallacy of critical theory, the real problem, is that human sin is never addressed. Human sin is, is castigated. Uh, racism is deemed a systematic problem rather than a heart problem. Critical theory and critical race theory, they see people again in two categories. And I keep mentioning this because you've got to get this. If you want to understand the ideology, you've got to see that, that they only see the oppressed and the oppressors. But the Word of God categorizes men as being two categories, basically. That is, children of God are spiritually dead. That's the only two categories biblically that there is. There is no oppressed by skin color or, or economic class but it's rather, are you spiritually alive to God or spiritually dead? So we don't need to utilize secular humanistic ideologies to use as an analytical tool in order to examine the hearts of men. That, that'll that never work. We need the word of the living God, the only tool that has the power to save and bring lasting change and furthermore, bring reconciliation to man. Only the gospel can do that. Only the gospel can, can reconcile our differences. Only the gospel at the foot of the cross can make us equal or see each other as equals and brothers. Everything else will divide. Only the gospel can bring lasting peace and unify the hearts of men. And in Christ, we are all one family of multiple ethnicities, all equal in value. And you see, critical race theory does not see equality in value that they see one above the other and they seek to tear it down and redistribute the power system is what they're after. Ultimately, it's not the gospel. It, it can't even be used as an analytical tool because it's introducing anti-gospel concepts into evangelism. That's why this is dangerous. That's why the Southern Baptist Convention this year in Nashville is so important in June for Baptists, if you're listening, to get there, to go, to let your voice be heard and known. I'll close with this, and it's just such a powerful statement by the Apostle Paul. It's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 through 22, and he says this, For he, that is Christ himself, is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of the commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, again, making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Listen to the language of peace, of reconciliation, of man, only by the blood of the cross. And he, that is Jesus, came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together 
in a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now, what a powerful verse that is to show that only the cross of Christ can bring reconciliation of men, that can bring us all into one body as Jesus Christ has laid out through his gospel. So, so next week, we're going to go more into this, Garrett. Uh, we've talked before. We're going to look at the idea and the implications of how this is going to affect the church and, and more of the terminology of, of wokeism, which is being used even within Christian circles, but it's being used as a, a good thing. And we're going to show why this is such a destructive thing and, and expose the fallacy behind it as well. Amen. Thank you, Brother Charlie. And thank you for everyone for tuning in for episode 13 of The White Harvest. Be sure to join us next week as we talk about CRT part two. Bye-bye. God bless. You have been listening to The White Harvest Podcast with Pastor Charlie Parrish and Pastor Garrett Skirbina. For more information, go to foothillscommunitychurch.org.